And for more on technology infrastructure, I'm joined by Julian Gorman, head of Asia Pacific GSMA, and Patrick Kirby, director of TMT at KPMG China. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today for this conversation. Now, of course, we're all waiting on the rollout of 5G across the globe. Earlier this year, we saw Verizon. They became the first to roll out uh, such a network. Now, what do you think and how do you think 5G is going to be changing our lives? Let's start with you. Well, I think there are some great opportunities that 5G is going to introduce. And uh, this is broadly both some expected and unexpected cases. If you take your mind back 10 years, no one really could have imagined the opportunities that 4G introduced. But broadly speaking, I think there's big focus around uh, high quality video, um, uh, interaction uh, in uh, personal communication, and that then has commercial enterprises as well, particularly in health, finance and trading, and also just uh, public service. I, I'd say uh, I have to agree. Um, 5G is actually, it's more than just a new generation of technology. It's more than just an incremental improvement. It actually changes the way we'll be able to communicate with each other and the way we'll be able to interact. The, the low latency and the ultra high speed in a mobile environment introduces a whole bunch more potential use cases and really a platform for innovation where in 10 years time we might be looking back and saying, well, we didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think the real potential for, for changing enterprise and the way even consumers interact with each other and the, and the world around us is really upon us. Is the take up going to be different between enterprise and consumer? Well, I think uh, enterprise is always a little slower to take up. Um, I think uh, a lot of the industry now is focused on the enterprise use cases, the potential changes to manufacturing industry. Um, a lot of it, I think, in the short term will be driven a lot by IoT. I mean, the potential for 5G to support massive connectivity in a small space really uh, gives the opportunity for um, a massive explosion in data that can then be brought together with, uh, you know, uh, big data analysis and then analysed and used for a platform for innovation. So whether that's in the enterprise space or in smart cities, in, in managing the way the cities operate, really. How quickly do you expect full take-up of 5G technology? Well, it will certainly take years for the networks to be deployed, and there are some aspects to the, to the technology which will sort of slow that down. But I totally agree that consumers will be leading this for the most part. Uh, the voracious appetite for video to be in better quality, for gaming, uh, for the lifestyle aspects will certainly drive it. We've already seen 5G handsets come out over the last 12 months and as live releases uh, happen throughout uh, 2020, I think we'll really start to see that sort of become the default as people you know, move to a new handset, move into new plans. Julian, not long ago we were talking about 2G, then 3G, 4G, and that was led a lot by US, Europe, and Japan. With the, the take up of 5G, do you think it's gonna be any different? Uh, no, I mean, we see actually Asia is really the center or, or the, where the massive population of 5G is. I mean, we expect China to be probably more than a third of users by about 2025. We're forecasting around 1.4 billion users uh, of 5G by 2025, which is about 16% of the total user base. Um, and a lot of that is, I mean, obviously consumers uh, taking it up. As, as uh, Patrick said, I mean, device replacement. I mean, there's always people who are going to buy the latest and greatest device. Um, and we're already seeing in 5G the availability of devices is faster than in previous generations. If you cast your mind back to 10 or 12 years ago, the amount of devices that were available in the first year of 4G um, was less than what we're seeing now. Um, and, the, and the capability of the devices obviously are, are, are much higher than in those days. So um, we do see a lot of, lot of growth. Uh, I mean, US is probably the second largest market, but China will certainly be growing. I mean, if in Korea, we're already seeing more than 5 million people expected to be on 5G by the end of the year. And really, I mean, it's consumers being driven with immersive entertainment, whether through sports or other augmented reality or virtual reality. I mean, they're really seeing that's what's driving consumer take up at the moment. Now, it's really become a race because we heard from U.S. President Donald Trump. He says that he wants the U.S. to win this race. China, of course, is in a big bid to try and get out there as well. Uh, who do you think is winning this so-called race? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on how, how you determine a race. Like, what is the finishing line? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, when you say who was first to launch, you know, you can argue Korea, America. Um, in numbers of take-ups um, and the type of take-ups. I mean, there's many different ways you could break this race down. Um, I think uh, the important thing is actually the adoption and, and stick to a global standard that 
uh, promotes an ecosystem that can grow in, you know, in a, in a single ecosystem. Previous generations, you know, I've got to cast back a generation or two ago, when we had multiple different technologies around the world, there wasn't interoperability, and that really hampered take up. So with 4G, the world came together, and now with 5G again, it's important that we stick together and actually promote the ecosystem and stimulate an ecosystem that is globally interoperable um, so that it grows as fast and is not hampered by you know, any sort of different technologies or diversions. I think there's no doubt that Chinese users are much more sophisticated in the use of data and mobility. So I would fully expect that the adoption both in China and through Asia Pacific is faster than in the West. Um, the dependency of the mobile in all aspects of life, payments, interaction and so forth, uh, you know, really three or four years at least ahead of uh, where we see in other markets. So I would expect in terms of adoption, um, that will drive really different creative, th uh, creative use cases and ways that people in China and Asia Pacific, which will uh, be really quite interesting to watch. Now, with... I was just going to say, uh, I completely agree with that. Mm. I mean, it was only a couple of years ago we would talk about mobile first countries or markets as like a second class citizen. Yeah. But I mean, actually, it's mobile first markets, with that, which are Asia are driving the innovation in payments, adoption, usage, inclusiveness even. I mean, it is all driven, I think, largely in Asia. Yeah. Now, is there anything that's holding up the take up of this technology? I think ultimately there's, a, there's an availability thing, rollout. Um, you know, there is obviously nations need to go through the release of Spectrum, but um, also nations need to understand there's no, you don't have to wait for Spectrum. The, the creation of an ecosystem that will support 5G innovation can start with 4G. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can happen and a lot of things that should be done around the ecosystem and fostering growth and, and making the availability of, of coverage and high-speed broadband to the masses or, and to the population are essential actually to set yourself up for 5G. Now I want to ask a political question because uh, this sector or this topic has become very politicized by the United States uh, with China as well. As we have an ongoing Sino-US trade war, the names like ZTE and Huawei be have become political pawns, if you will. Now it's been targeted by the United States and because uh, that is, some countries are being lobbied to not use Chinese technology, Huawei or ZTE. As a result of this, would this create d multiple or double standards? Well, I can't talk to the specifics of any particular vendor in the market, but I think it does highlight that as infrastructure becomes more dependent on 5G and the core backbones underneath it, uh, it's right and proper that governments are thinking about uh, all, uh, what are the vulnerability points, and uh, I have full confidence that as those checks are performed, then uh, you know, they'll be proven to be compliant. So as we have the take-up of 5G, this is going to be, of course, fueling the development of IoT, the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. autonomous driving. What does that look like? Uh, I mean, I would say that the future looks very bright. I mean, the, the opportunities um, that can come. But uh, when we say, like, autonomous driving, uh, health, uh, the things that can happen, there's also to consider that actually emerging market countries in the not-too-distant future will also be launching 5G. And their use cases actually could be very different. Um, and even if you look in 4G, there's innovations that have come out of Asia. Um, you know, some of the services like you know, Gojek, Grab, I mean WeChat, the, th the, the innovations actually happened over 4G in Asia. Suggest also in emerging markets there will be 5G use cases that we don't necessarily foresee. I think the key thing is uh, 5G has an opportunity to add significantly to the digital economies of all nations um, as they adopt it, but it is uh, it's even more important, I think, that actually nations, when they consider uh, governments, when they consider going down the 5G path, that it has to be a collaborative effort. It's not just a matter of making spectrum available, but it's actually working with industry and the ecosystem to create a digital economy outcome rather than any short-term you know, economic benefit from spectrum cell. Patrick, we need to have 5G in order of for uh, smart cities uh, to, to grow and develop. Here in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government has been trying to push forward this idea of becoming a smart city as well. Where are we in that? Well, I think it's really important to think about how do the community, how do citizens think about wh what they expect from a smart city and making sure that governments are responding to that. So you know, at the moment, I think there's still a bit of confusion generally about you know, what, are the, what are the characteristics. Does it mean just universities? Uh, does it mean uh, solar panels on roofs? Does it mean an open data strategy? Well, 
uh, while all those uh, components are correct, you know, what we're seeing from smart city uh, citizens is that what they're looking for is how that translates to lower emissions, lower, uh, less traffic uh, congestion issues, um, better air. Uh, now these uh, change in the different cities and the studies that we've examined uh, around the world. Uh, so that's for me the important thing is to take a, a government perspective beyond an IoT discussion or a 5G discussion, but how does it make the, the life of people easier and simpler? Now, we talk about uh, 5G and uh, the development uh, of it, the take up of it, but what about the cost of it? It's supposedly 20 times faster than that of 4G. What does that mean for our pocketbooks? Is it going to cost 20 times more? I think, uh, I mean, obviously the rollout of the infrastructure, and we talk about millimetre wave cells being much smaller and street furniture being uh, part of the infrastructure. Um, obviously the, the rollout of that to the, to the scale that uh, is maybe required by some of the visions requires also to consider optimization and other things, you know, like approvals to turn your bus shelter into, um, you know, into a base station. Things like that. And so it's important, that, again, that government comes together and realises that um, it, there's also efficiencies required. I mean, if you want to achieve those smart city ambitions, I mean, it's not just a matter of the concept of an IoT sensor somewhere, but actually, what is the infrastructure, what is the framework that allows that to happen in a cost-efficient way? Operators and vendors are working together to make sure that you know, this is the most cost-efficient deployment they can. Um, but it it's also has to be in a framework. It's not just about the, the magic box, the piece of equipment that actually broadcasts 5G in isolation. It actually has to be the whole ecosystem um, that's considered. Is there anything that's stopping the development of 5G? I think uh, to the, when we talk about smart cities, I mean, uh, smart cities actually compete globally. I mean, obviously Hong Kong's always been a global city, but it, I mean, as you move towards smart city, Hong Kong competes even more with other global cities in being one of those leaders. And so being a leader requires constant attention and looking forward to making sure there's a framework to support that. Um, and at the moment, I would say uh, a lot of smart cities, even across Asia, have still some way to go in understanding, okay, the government needs to maybe do more in making sure that the infrastructure can be deployed you know, in an efficient, cost-efficient way and, and speedy you know, uh, way to make sure that the coverage is available um, where it's needed and to move forward. Are there any other smart cities uh, that are, we should take note of? Uh, I know that Hong Kong is always in competition with the likes of Singapore. Yeah, I think around the world there are great uh, characteristics to be p picked up from lots of different cities. Uh, and I think there's a lot of virtuous learning that's going on between those smart city groups already. A career that was touched on before is very progressive around uh, open data platforms. Uh, if you have a look at uh, what it means for public safety in some of the US cities where, you know, uh, concerns about walking the streets safely at night often come up, you know, that's not such an issue in many of the cities uh, here in China. So there are different dimensions that can be sort of brought together and learned from. I think a common theme, again, is this uh, open, openness of the environment and openness of the data. And how do you make sure that there's both contribution into those data platforms, but then also the right access, whether that be from consumers, enterprise, NGOs, uh, you know, the public sector itself. When we talk about technology, we also have to look ahead. What's next? What are you, what are you guys keeping an eye out on? Uh, well, I think there's still a fair way to run on 5G, but um, I know there's already, you know, there's already people talking about 6G. Um, but I think uh, the next, you know, next number of years are going to provide plenty of, uh, plenty of discussion about, about the new opportunities. I mean, you think we're 10 years into 4G, you know, and, and the amount that's happened even in the, in the last two years, you know, um, if you project that forward, then I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation and growth and and excitement um, about what comes from 5G over the next 10 years or more. I think there are probably three things that I'm really quite interested in continuing to follow. Uh, the first one is what's the relationship between quantum computing and its huge appetite for data and its ability to process that data and what do these 5G networks do to contribute into that. The second one is in the retail space. Again, 5G is a mobile platform and so the use of 5G for, say, augmented reality for the shopping experience to get people off buying online and back into the shopping centres, I think will be uh, an interesting one. And then the third one is around content. So we're seeing these huge uh, media plays around the world with new digital platforms coming on. Uh, and so 
as the quality of that content comes through, both, say, through movies and sporting events, I think that'll be interesting. So the, uh, the Olympics in, in Japan next year, I think, will be a really interesting showcase about how these different uh, pieces can, can come together. So, of course, our, a lot of our conversation today here has been about 5G. What is the lifespan of 5G? Do you think that within 10 years it will see 6G? I think, uh, well, I mean, we're saying 16% you know, of the global users by 2025 using 5G. Um, 4G is still around six, two thirds of the global users will be on 4G in 2025. 20, 2025. So, uh, I mean, 5G has a lot more to run than 10 years, I think. Um, whether or not another technology comes along, obviously, will depend on the value add and, and what the incremental benefits it can drive. Um, I think in 10 years' time, uh, you know, 5G is, is, is still going to be a major player and 4G will still be a, a good portion of um, the market globally. Um, in, but in some markets, uh, you know, like Korea and stuff, maybe it's, it's fading by then. Just to add to that point, you know, what we see is with the technology curve, Moore's law uh, going through technologies get faster. Um, the, the question will be, can we create enough content yeah. that demands um, you know, yes. this extra capacity in the network? So I think for at least the next 10 years, it's going to take a lot of high quality you know, video content, IoT content, yeah. uh, it's an adoption in industry, which will start to push it up to its edge, which will be the, the trigger for 6G or beyond. So we'll continue to watch the take up of 5G. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming to speak to us today. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've been speaking with Julian Gorman, head of Asia Pacific GSMA, and Patrick Kirby, director of TMT at KPMG China.